and uh, it's a pleasure to try and join um, New York. I guess there is no um, conference this time in um, in June this year again. Oh no, no, there will be. Uh, yeah. Just that I've been uh, too lazy and busy to. Uh, to send out announcements and to ask people to give talks. Right, but it will still be uh, online, so. Oh, absolutely, yes, I mean, it's easy. Uh, yeah. No one has to worry about travel plans. <laughs> yep, easy, but less fun. Anyway, oh, yes. I'm going to try and tell you about uh, linear equations in system of the primes. It is uh, a current work I'm I'm uh, finishing right now with Unity Levain and Fernando Shao. Um, let's see if I can, what's going on? Right, so uh, I'm going to start by reminding you or perhaps showing you for the first time, I don't know, the Green Tower Theorem, which is the, uh, a statement about dense set of integers. So think a set of integers where I take a positive proportion of integers, 10% of integers or even 1%. Um, and uh, that means that the limit superior, superior limit, the upper limit of uh, uh, the, the number of elements of A until N on uh, divided by the number of elements of B until N is positive. In such a case, I say A is dense in B. So the Green Tower theorem said that any dense subsets of set P of primes contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions, which might come up later under the name of AP, because I may be late. So this uh, was a brilliant breakthrough, which had been uh, kind of announced by earlier uh, quite impressive results already. So the oldest one on this topic was certainly the van der Kopput theorem, which uh, states that the primes themselves, a set of primes, contain infinitely many three terms arithmetic progressions. And not only they contain that, but they contain many and they contain um, exactly the number you think actually until n. So that's about the full set of primes, crucially not about a dense set. So automatically it also works for a 99% set uh, of the primes, but not for a 1% set of the prime, for instance. So that's about really the full set of primes. And um, Green on his own, uh, at some point already had proven that, uh, well, he had proven the three terms arithmetic progressions case. So the length three statement of the, of what was uh, going to become the Green Tower theorem. So any density of the primes contains any three terms arithmetic progressions. And similarly had proven uh, that any density of the integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Um, so that's not about the primes and uh, the set of primes is not a dense subset. So that's, uh, that doesn't seem to help directly to prove the green tower theorem, but actually it, it does massively. It, is in, it was uh, of uh, the green tower theorem. So what I'm going to discuss in this talk is what can be said about sparse set of the primes? Um, one example I, I will talk about is the set of almost twin primes, the chain primes. The set of primes P such that P plus two has at most two prime factors. So that's not quite twin primes because we don't even know if there exist infinitely many of them. So I won't be able to say whether they contain many uh, arithmetic progressions at all, but um, we know that the set of primes p to the p plus two has at most two prime factors is infinite and is quite large. So we, there is a hope to do something about it and I will show you that. Also, this leaves open the question about uh, other linear configurations 
to give me another system of linear equations, can I tell you whether this system contains or not solutions in a given set of primes? Um, so it's important to understand a, a bit more the similarities theorem to make sense of the green tower theorem. The similarities theorem can be stated in a functional form as I do above, equivalently to the set theoretic version uh, I stated initially. And uh, then it is this, a statement about a function on the integers to the set, the interval 0, 1, which has a, a positive average. So it is uh, the sum of two x is at least delta x for infinitely many x, where delta is a positive constant. Um, then you have a, a, a statement about the average of this function on arithmetic progressions. So you take an arithmetic progression, you take the product of the values of f at the uh, elements of this progression, you take the average of all progressions. And uh, similarly, theorem tell you that this is going to be uh, an average, a positive average, in, which is uh, delta k plus one. So uh, a quite simple average. Well, actually, actually, there is also an implied constant here, which I, which we cannot really explicit, or I, at least I won't do it here. Um, so that's cool, but it's uh, about bounded function. Equivalently, the set theoretic version was about dense set. Dense set are uh, the sets that you can, uh, uh, well, where you can define a bounded function which has a positive weight like this. So if you want to apply this to the primes, you would actually want to apply this to uh, something like uh, logarithmic weight on the prime. So the function logarithm times indicator function of a set of primes so that it may have uh, this positive average condition. So uh, then it won't be bounded anymore, of course. So you can apply this. But the, the proof of green toe consists in uh, approximating such an unbounded function by uh, a bounded function. And to be able to approximate a bounded function by a non-bounded function, they needed uh, a notion of uh, being bounded by a pseudo-random function. So now, regarding the question of other linear configurations, uh, if you consider more closely Gower's proof of similarities theorem, you can see that um, uh, you can replace the configuration n, n plus d, n plus 2d up to n plus kd by uh, any uh, system of linear forms, which is translation invariant, by which I mean that uh, the configuration of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is in uh, the image of, uh, well, is one of such configurations. So that's called translation invariant because whenever you have uh, one of these configurations, if you translate all the elements by the same number, you get still a configuration of the same shape. And so the Green Tower theorem also then applies to this kind of linear configurations. It's not specifically about uh, arithmetic progressions, it's about uh, translation invariant linear configurations. So what we will be left to do uh, will be really, uh, what about non-translation invariant linear configurations? Anyway, now let's see this, this reasoning of Green and Tao, which consists in approximating uh, a set by, uh, well, a subset of a dense pseudorandom set, uh, well, approximating a, a subset of a pseudorandom set by a dense set of the integers was applied to many uh, subsets of the primes. For, so for originally by Green and Tao to any dense subset of the primes. Uh, later on by Zhu 
to chain primes that I have just talked about. Pins had uh, shown something like that for bounded gap primes. Uh, so the primes uh, P such that the next prime is a, is a bounded uh, constant uh, away from it. Uh, there is also a paper about primes of the form x squared plus y squared plus one. They uh, therefore uh, equally contain uh, uh, arithmetic progressions of any length. Uh, also kind of recently on Piedetsky Shapiro primes, the primes of the form integer part of n to the c, where c is uh, uh, greater than one, but not much greater. And then any dense subset of any of, of these sets I've just mentioned. So the only ingredient to, uh, uh, that you need to prove above on above the uh, ingredients of Grand Tau is uh, to show that a suitably normalized indicator function of uh, such sets, by which I mean essentially a function of average one, which is weight, which is uh, supported on these sets uh, can be bounded by a pseudo random measure. Uh, where, so what is a pseudo random measure or pseudo random function? A pseudo random function is essentially um, a function which uh, has average one on any uh, linear system. And actually I mean any linear system of a, bound, of a finite complexity, which means no two forms psi i, no two of the linear forms psi i are affinely dependent. Uh, all right, so what about other linear configurations? The linear configurations that are still finite complexity, no two forms are affinely dependent, but perhaps non translation invariant. So one, 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 one is perhaps not in the image of the system of form. Well, Green and Tau again, with a crucial ingredient of a uh, Ziegler, uh, had proven that the, uh, uh, the primes contain uh, such uh, configurations. I mean, any uh, contain solutions to any system of linear forms as soon as some local conditions, obvious local conditions are satisfied. And they even gave the asymptotic. So this asymptotic is a constant times the uh, uh, simple n to the d term that you expect. And this constant is, uh, is defined in terms of the, of the local phenomena modulo p for each prime p. So, uh, to prove this, not only they approximated f by a bounded function, they even managed to approximate f, the von Mangold function or the logarithm times indicator function of the primes by the constant function one. Um, so there you cannot replace the full set of primes by a subset of the primes, not even a dense subset. Um, because you can't uh, approximate such a set by constant function anymore. Uh, except in a few uh, simple cases. So, of course, a simple case is uh, the, the primes uh, of an arithmetic progression of a residue class. Um, and I, I also proved a few years ago that. Uh, um, you can get an asymptotic uh, for the number of configurations in shifted square free primes, by which I mean the set of primes p, so that p minus one is square free. But this is very simple set, a very nice set, which, is a, uh, which has nice properties. And in general, this is not possible. So in this talk, I will I will show how to do at least some things for uh, configurations which are non-translation invariant and 
simultaneously the set of primes is not the full set of primes and is not any of these exceptions I've just mentioned. And in particular, the, the set of primes I have in mind are uh, the chain primes, P that P plus two has at most two prime factors. I will even assume that both of the prime factors are at least P to the one tenth. And P to the set of uh, integers n such that the intervals, the interval from n to n plus k contains at least two primes for something like k equals 600, for instance. So this, uh, uh, this is not quite a set of primes, actually. This is a set of integers n, uh, such the interval, the bounded length interval from n contains uh, two primes. So it's still quite near the notion of uh, uh, bounded, uh, uh, bounded gas primes, but it's actually not a set of primes. A bit I, I, must, I, I must not be clear on what this P2 is. I mean, P2 is a long interval, right? Uh, I mean, you, of integers you start, no, I mean, yeah, you start off with N and you yeah. look at a long interval, right? And the... the it's a short uh, interval, actually, from my point yeah, of view. But, 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 it's, but it has... When you say only integers whose smallest prime factor is at least, you mean... You mean the uh, integer n itself should have no small prime factors, right? Uh, you don't mean that the interval should only contain numbers with small prime factors. That's no, not possible. Is, yeah, sorry. This is a yeah. This is a mistake. This is a mistake here. Uh, it's only n whose smallest prime factors. Yes. Okay. Right. Got it. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. This is rubbish here. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry. So these two sets, which are quite not set of primes, the first one is set of primes, the second not really. Uh, we know that they they are quite large, at least uh, up to up to n. You have at least uh, n over some power of log n elements. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you have the, these results through a variance of Chen and Maynard theorem. And what we prove with the Shao and Terevainen is uh, that, uh, well, if you take uh, a function which gives weights to these sets of uh, integers in a suitable way, and you consider again these averages on a linear configurations, linear configuration made of uh, affine inner forms uh, of which no two uh, are affinely dependent as usual. Uh, then I can give you a lower bound for uh, this average, namely uh, uh, mostly determined by uh, local, uh, local obstructions modulo small primes. This is a constant depending on the uh, on the set of linear forms and which is uh, expressed in terms of the behavior of the system of affine linear forms modulo small primes. Well, and small, some constant here as well, which I won't make explicit. So in other words, we, we prove that these sets of integers uh, contain a solution to linear systems uh, as long as the linear system doesn't have an obvious obstruction why uh, there shouldn't be solutions in your set, uh, uh, in your set uh, modulo uh, small primes. So yeah, I'll explain roughly how this works. And the main uh, new novelty here is that this wasn't known for non-transition invariant systems. So as I said earlier, it's, this was proven for uh, uh, arithmetic progressions of any length, but uh, not really, well, and therefore for any translation invariant system, but, but not for general systems. And we are proving that for general systems. So uh, why is it harder to, um, to handle non-translation invariant equations? Um, 
the, the, there is a simple reason. If you take a, an homogeneous linear equation, which is non transition invariant, like the uh, x plus y equals z equation, or maybe I can call it the Schur equation, or well, maybe Schur triple. So if you take uh, the set of odd numbers, odd integers, it doesn't contain a solution, obviously. And it is a, a quite dense set of integers. Uh, so uh, that immediately proves that even dense set of integers may have zero solution to non-translation invariant equations. Uh, so you, you may uh, object that the example I've just given you uh, is, a, a bit, uh, is a bit of a cheat because I'm using a residue class. So maybe if I simultaneously impose a density condition and an equidistribution condition, maybe I get the necessity of existence of uh, solutions. And indeed, it, it works for a certain uh, systems of equations. So in particular for this Schur equation, but this doesn't uh, work in general. Or for instance, if we take this system of two equations, uh, it's just one example among, among uh, many that you can imagine. This has no solutions in a, some, some sets A that I suggest here, which uh, is dense and uniformly distributed across uh, residue classes. So even being as simultaneously dense and uniformly distributed doesn't, doesn't grant uh, a set the existence of solutions to a given system of equations when this system is not transition invariant. So we must understand a bit more deeper what's, uh, what's special about not transition invariant. We need, we need uh, another notion of uniformity, a, no, a stronger notion of a uniform distribution in a sense. It doesn't suffice to be uniformly distributed across residue classes. It's even more, uh, even stronger notion of uniformity that you need. So I, I'm not going to explain um, what I call a transference principle because it's about transferring a result for a dense set to proving something for a uh, sparse set. So we, I transfer a dense set to a sparse set. So the setting we are working in, on is uh, we have a, an average of a function on a linear system. <coughs> I, <coughs> I call it T psi of it the average of f on the system of li linear forms psi. Uh, and I would like to uh, approximate perhaps my function f by a, a bounded function uh, in such a way that the, the average on psi or the psi count, I would call it the psi count of f is close to the psi count of f tilde, in which case I will say that f tilde is a dense model of f for the uh, system psi. And if simultaneously this dense model could be uh, pointwise lower bounded, that is f tilde of n is always greater than delta, some positive delta, uh, then it is trivial that uh, psi count of f is uh, bounded by delta to the g. So is, there, yeah. is, there, is there a reason that the domain of f tilde is suddenly all the integers rather than uh, the natural numbers? That, that, uh, does that signify anything? Sorry, tell it again. The domain of f tilde, you wrote it goes from oh, z. Yeah. To z. Sorry, is there yeah. a reason? No. OK. No, no not really. No. I could know it doesn't matter actually because I'm only going to evaluate it at uh, positive integers, I suppose. Uh, so here I could be evaluating things at negative integers. Maybe these forms have negative coefficients, but in, in that case, if my function was defined only on positive integers are extended by zero, uh, it doesn't matter. 
Um, all right. So uh, the simple example of a, of an interesting uh, non-translation non invariant system is the Goldbach equation system. So ternary Goldbach problem is the configuration n1, n2, capital N minus n1 minus n2. Uh, so for that system, a dense model was uh, constructed uh, by uh, Matomaki and Shao in, uh, in uh, such a way that actually the dense model was uh, a convolution of the original function with uh, a Bohr set, uh, something like that. So something uh, essentially defined in terms of Fourier analysis. Uh, but I won't go into more detail there. So uh, that means that uh, what we are left to do is to understand the distribution of F in both sets. Yeah, and uh, if you understand that well enough, you will manage to prove that the dense model of F being a convolution of F with a Bohr set uh, has uh, this lower bound pointwise. And then you're done. So in this way, Matomeki and Shao proved that any uh, sufficiently large number is a sum of three bounded uh, gap primes or three chain primes. Uh, and uh, when I say any sufficiently large number, it's, it has to satisfy, of course, obvious local conditions. But uh, apart from that, every sufficiently large number. So the Goldbach problem with uh, the summons restricted to a special set of primes. Uh, so what we do here is uh, we try to uh, provide conditions which ensure that the function f you uh, are working on admits a pointwise lower bounded model. Uh, and this pointwise lower bounded model will not be defined in terms of both sets, but in a more complicated way. Um, and we will try to show that this, uh, uh, this uh, dense model is um, lower point is lower bounded pointwise. So we'll have to understand uh, the distribution of F in higher order both sets in a way. All right, so I explained a bit what these higher order both sets I'm mentioning are. For that, I may need to tell you a few words about Gower's norms. So Gower's norms are defined on a group. Uh, but you may think of the group essentially uh, as, as the cyclic group Z over NZ, which I will sometimes uh, identify with the interval one to N. So the Gower's norms of, of, of order K of the function F on the, a group G uh, is uh, the average of uh, the function F on the uh, points of a cube, essentially. So uh, this is the, the vertices of a cube, x, x plus a, x plus b, x plus a plus b, for instance, when k equals 2. And you consider the average of f. Uh, I mean, you take, the, you take a cube, and you take the product of the values of f on the cube. You take the conjugate if uh, your vertex is uh, uh, is uh, uh, a not distance away from the origin, take the product of all that, and you take the average over all cubes of of these products. That's the Gower's norms, and then you must also take the power uh, one over two to the k. But uh, anyway, this is this is a norm. It's not obvious that it's a norm. But it is. It may not even be obvious that this is a positive real number, but this is a positive real number. Uh, so this is a family of norm, and uh, they are they define a finer and finer topology. 
uh, in the sense that the, the Gauss norm of order k is smaller than the Gauss norm of order k plus one. And the Gauss norm of order two, the U2 norm, is uh, actually the L4 norm of the Fourier transform. So there is a strong link be, uh, between the U2 norm and the Fourier analysis, but there is no link between U3 or higher order norm and uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, so these norms in this sense define a higher order notion of Fourier analysis. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I will sometimes want to identify Z over NZ with an interval. So I will define the Gower's norms over an interval by uh, uh, injecting, in fact, this interval in a slightly larger cyclic group and uh, considering the Gower's number of F extended to this larger cyclic group uh, divided then by the uh, Gower's norm of the indicator function of the interval one to n. So yeah, that's the Gower's norm. And what's good about these Gower's norms is that they are the, uh, they control multilinear systems. They control the average of functions on a system of affine linear equations. So that's a statement that is usually referred to as a von Neumann theorem. And uh, it's, it says that if you have a system of affine linear forms, as always, not two of which are affinely dependent and uh, functions uh, f1 up to ft, which are one bounded in modules, uh, then the average of the product of the fi on the evaluated at psi i of n as n ranges on uh, the cube uh, n to the d is bounded in terms of the Gower's norm of each of the function. And here the u t minus one norm suffices. Uh, so it's as soon as you have one of the function fi, which uh, has a small Gower's norm, the whole system is going to be small. So uh, here it's a statement about one bounded function. And we are not going to work with one bounded function, as you know, because we are going to work on sparse sets. So we, we're going to work with unbounded function. So to uh, still be able to use a fundamental theorem, we will replace boundedness by the property of being bounded by a pseudorandom measure, which I define here. So uh, a pseudorandom measure is actually not a measure, it's more like a sequence of functions uh, on cyclic group uh, z over nz with n tending to infinity, uh, satisfying the following property that the average of uh, any system of linear form uh, on uh, in this function nu is uh, always one. So this is quantified by a uh, session of M0, D0, L0 on the measure. So I, I have a bounded number of forms in a bounded number of variables and they have, they have bounded uh, coefficients. And I take the average and I always get one and the little O of one uh, is a, uh, uh, dependent only on M0, D0, L0. Okay. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this von Neumann theorem is uh, originally valid for one bounded functions, but it may be extended to um, simply functions which are bounded by a pseudorandom measure. And now, we know that 
if you want to understand uh, linear systems, you need to understand simply Gower's norms. So how is it simpler to understand Gower's norms? Because Gower's norms are themselves the averages of uh, the function you're working on uh, on a particular linear system. So it, if you are not uh, able to understand the averages on linear system, you're going to, aver to understand the uh, average on this particular linear system. But actually, there is another way to characterize uh, functions which have large Gaussian norms. And they are um, the functions which correlate with what is called a nil sequence. And now I'm going to very briefly try and uh, define nil sequences, although it's a, it's a very complicated topic. So it's, it is defined by first introducing uh, nil manifolds. And the nil manifold is defined by introducing nilpotent Lie groups. So I say G is a nilpotent Lie group uh, if, uh, if it is not maybe abelian, but not far from abelian, in the sense that if I take the successive commutators group, I ultimately end up on the trivial group. Uh, so if uh, I immediately end up on the trivial group, um, that means I'm abelian. It means the commutators are always zero, but maybe I don't immediately end up on um, zero, but if I repeat the operation several times, I, I get uh, the trivial group. So then that's called a nilpotent uh, group. And uh, I call S step nilpotent if G S plus one, the S plus one iterates S plus first iterate of this construction is the identity. And now if um, gamma is a discrete co-compact subgroup of G, um, co-compact being uh, meaning that the quotient G over gamma is compact, uh, then the quotient G over gamma is called a nil manifold. Um, and then a nil sequence is a sequence of the form f of uh, gn x, where gx are in g and uh, f is a continuous function on the nil manifold. OK, so maybe I need to give examples. Otherwise, it is not necessarily a nice definition. Uh, so what is a nice example of a of a nilpotent group, well, an abelian group. So nilpotent abelian, uh, I mean, abelian Lie group could be R. And in R, you have a nice discrete co compact subgroup, which is Z. And uh, this gives rise to a nil manifold, which is R over Z, which is the circle. And, and then a nice example of a nil sequence is uh, exponential of I alpha N for instance. So that's uh, the canonical example of nil sequence. And that's called a one step nil sequence because it's one step nil potent uh, group. Um, and a slightly complete, more complicated one is given by the Heisenberg group, the group of uh, three by three upper triangular matrices with real entries whose diagonal is uh, one. Um, this group admits uh, a nice discrete co-compact subgroup, which is uh, simply uh, given by uh, replacing the real entries by integer entries. And working a bit on this uh, example, uh, uh, allows you to create a two-step nil sequence, which is something like uh, this uh, bracket polynomial sequence. So I take uh, uh, exponential i alpha n, uh, fractional part of beta n or uh, integer part of beta n. I can realize this 
essentially as a new sequence or not quite as a kind of well, anyway they are very closely related to this Eisenberg group so uh, that's examples you should have in mind of new sequences or more generally uh, exponential of uh, i alpha n to the uh, two or three or five so uh, polynomials um, in n of which then you take a complex exponential all right so what's happening now is that uh, i can characterize function with large gauss norms uh, in terms of new sequences uh, so the statement is uh, the following uh, every function that that is one bounded and that satisfies uh, the gauss norms of order s plus one is at least delta uh, there exists uh, a nil manifold and a nil sequence on it where uh, which is uh, such that the function correlates with this nil sequence in the sense that the average of the product f of n times the nil sequence is uh, at least well not delta actually but the constant depending only on delta so that should be here a c of delta or something like that so that's the, the statement. Um, and uh, the new sequence I need to consider is can be taken in a finite collection of new sequence of nil manifolds. And the Lipschitz constant of the function f may also be taken bounded in terms of the quality of the bound you have on the Gauss norm and the degree of uniformity. So you need to, if you want to show that the function has low Gauss norm, you just need to show it doesn't correlate with uh, not too complicated nil sequences. That's not too bad if you, if you have uh, nice properties for nil sequences, and there is nice properties for nil sequences. They are very structured sequences. So it's kind of nice to work with them. Uh, so um, yeah, that's, that explains the link between Gauss norm and nil sequences. Now nil sequences will occur in the, what is perhaps our main theorem because it is the general principle that we apply to our sets of primes. Uh, and so it says the following story. Uh, so as always, I have a system of linear forms. I want to evaluate the average of F on this system. And I, uh, I would like to, um, uh, yeah. So I know that F has a positive average delta, and I would like to show that the average on a, on a linear system is large as well in terms of delta. And I can do that. That's our theorem. As soon as I have only the two following conditions. So first, a pseudo randomness condition, which is that f is bounded by a pseudo-random measure of sufficiently good quality. Uh, but I don't need very good quality. So uh, that's the first condition. And second condition is um, uh, that f is uh, what I call dense in higher order ball sets, by which I simply mean that uh, the average with the nil sequence um, uh, psi is at least delta times the uh, average of psi. Uh, so I'm sure I made it clear, but this nil sequences uh, psi here, they are, so this family of nil sequences, um, they, they are nil sequences with value in zero, one. Okay, so, I consider the correlation of F with the uh, nil sequences with value in zero one 
And what I'm saying here is that uh, in every such new sequence, with every such new sequence, I have a positive proportion of the total weight of the nil sequence that uh, I obtain as a correlation of f with the nil sequence. So for instance, if f is uh, the constant function delta, that works. And what I'm saying is, is, is a sense that f is uh, larger than delta in, uh, from the point of view of uh, nil sequences. So from the point of view of higher order of sets. Okay, so that's the two conditions. And if I have these two conditions, then I, I know that my function gives a, a positive weight to solutions of my given uh, system of linear equations. So how do I prove such a, a statement? Well, there is a crucial lemma, which is here, and uh, it says the following thing. Um, so I, I, I have a function f, which is bounded by a pseudo-random measure, as always. And this function has uh, uh, this correlation of, with nil sequences property. So it's kind of at least delta with respect to, to every non to complicate it new sequence with value in zero one. Uh, then this function f is uh, equal to a decomposition f3 plus f4 where f3 is lower bounded pointwise and f4 has small un plus one norm. Uh, so I have uh, the possibility of writing f as almost, well, f is almost equal to a lower uh, bounded, lower uh, pointwise lower bounded function. So a function which is always at least, uh, let's say one half of delta. Uh, and the, the error I make is, is small in the Gower's norms topology. So how do I prove now this crucial lemma? Well, roughly speaking, I start with the decomposition uh, of f as a, a bounded function and a uniform function. So that's the original dense model theorem. That's kind of classical in now these days. There are many uh, such a version, many version of such statements. Uh, I approximate my function by a bounded function, and I allow myself a small Gower's norm error. Now, how it, what do I do with this bounded function? This bounded function it may not be pointwise lower bounded. It's just uh, taking its values between minus one and one, but I, I don't know if, uh, if it takes uh, uh, always values uh, bigger than delta or something like that. So how do I uh, replace f1 by pointwise lower bounded function? Well, I do the following thing. Uh, I use a, a tool that is already existent, which is called the weak regularity lemma, which consists in, again, uh, cons making a, a decomposition of F1 in two functions. One being, uh, um, one being small in uh, Gower's norm, G being small in Gower's norm, and H, being uh, expressed in terms of the correlations of uh, a uh, of uh, f with um, with nil sequences. So one is uh, can be expressed in terms of the uh, correlations with nil sequences, and therefore is pointwise lower bounded because all the correlations are quite large. So that's, that's going to be the pointwise lower bounded part. And there is then a, a uniform part. And uh, that's it for the decomposition, roughly speaking. That's it for the lemma. So how to use the, this lemma to prove the theorem of the previous slide? Um, well, 
this uh, directly follows from this decomposition and the von Neumann theorem, which says that uh, uniform uh, functions uh, give rise to negligible, uh, to negligible uh, linear correlations. So in, in this, uh, in this average here, I replace all the occurrence of f by f3 plus f4. And I get this way uh, 2 to the t averages. One of them involves always the function f3, and one of them involves at least one function f4. And whenever there is at least one function f4, this makes a very small uh, average. So what only counts is the one coming from the function f3 and the function f3 is lower bounded pointwise. Therefore, you get this lower bound from the average. So that's about it. So now the question is how do I prove that uh, chain primes and uh, bounded gap primes um, have this density in higher order both sets hypothesis? So remember, there are, there are two hypotheses. There is the pseudorandom measure hypothesis. But this one was essentially already proven by, by pins, for instance, for the uh, Maynard primes and by Zhuk uh, for the chain primes, when they proved that the, this set of primes contain arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. So they essentially proved this hypothesis already. So what I have to do if I want to do uh, things for non-translation invariant system is this additional uh, hypothesis density in higher order both sets. In other words, correlation of uh, my sets of primes with nil sequences. So uh, in other words, again, this amounts to checking that uh, nil sequences with values in 0, 1, have a, a, a reasonable good bit of weight on almost twin primes in the sense of chain or main. So, well, I don't have now the time to uh, say much about it, but the idea is that we have uh, statements of Matomaki Shao, which give condition uh, under which sequences give uh, good bits of weight to almost twin primes. And these conditions are as follows. The sequence omega n must be well distributed in arithmetic progressions in the sense that uh, the weight on each progression uh, modulo r, each class, each residue class modulo r is about one r of the total weight. Also, the weight of the sequence on uh, primes restricted to the congruence class C modulo r is about the same in every uh, class modulo r, actually. So uh, that's the first two conditions. And, this, and the last one is similar. It says that. Uh, the sequence is not too concentrated in any arithmetic progression. Uh, okay, so you have this good distribution property, and then you, you conclude that your sequence omega n gives a lot of weight to almost twin primes, or sufficiently good weight to almost twin primes. So uh, what we have to prove is that nil sequences satisfy all these properties. And uh, to do that, that's uh, an input that my co-authors proved in an earlier paper. Um, and that's kind of a, a bombieri vinogradov theorem for uh, nil sequences. So I have to stop here now because I've been too long. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have uh, any questions for uh, Pierre?
So I have a, a, a question, which is just um, <clears throat> with all of this high technology uh, that you use, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> if uh, the gods were kind to you, uh, what would you uh, like to prove about the primes? Uh, well, about the primes, uh, all that this technology uh, can prove has been exploited and <laughs> We know all uh, we can we can uh, know on the primes uh, in the sense that we we know even the asymptotic for the number of solutions to any uh, reasonable linear equation and uh, I'm afraid it can't go much further because it cannot do anything about uh, uh, systems uh, where two forms are affinity dependent so Sophie Jama primes are are binary Goldbach or twin primes. So uh, for the full set of primes, uh, there is not much more that I can do with this high technology. But you mean for other subset of the primes? Or oh, well, what we could hope is maybe to say more about polynomial equations. Um, and that's. That's something that this technology can sometimes do, but uh, in general, not yet. But that's maybe a direction where some progress can be made. Uh, so that was actually my next question, whether there was any way, for example, to get quadratic relations from the primes. Uh, um, yeah. So, the work that evolves from Gower's norms. And the, yes, the, Gower's norms, yeah. Uh, play a role as well in uh, understanding some polynomial configurations. Um, but mostly uh, configurations of the form, uh, well, polynomial progressions, that is like x plus uh, d square, x plus 2d square, x plus 3d square, stuff like that. Uh, so progression with a step a square that's uh, something a Gower's norm can say something about, for instance. And therefore, probably we could, we could also prove things for our subset of the primes uh, regarding uh, such quadratic configurations. But for more general configurations, uh, no, because uh, even the one uh, point configuration, 2n squared plus 1, we don't know if this is infinitely often a prime. So uh, that's already. It would be a nice result. <laughs> Hard enough, yeah. Are there other questions for Pierre? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've gotten a negative one on this before, but I'm just checking. Do these methods allow you to say anything about consecutive primes? Like, uh, you know, there exist infinitely many triplets of consecutive primes, which are arithmetic progressions, that sort of thing. Uh, let me think now, I'm not sure I know that. I should say that I asked Tommy Ziegler a couple of years ago when she came out with a definite no. So, uh, you know, maybe somebody's noticed something since then. Uh, okay, you know, uh, yeah, this, this sounds hard. Um, yeah, this sounds a bit too hard now. This probably is like as hard as Twin primes, for instance, or it's, uh, it sounds a bit too hard for me now. <laughs> but, a quick, yeah. A quick question. So the third of the three hypotheses that you wanted, wh why why this third one? Um, yeah. So you may think that it is weaker than this one, for instance, uh, but this is about well distribution for most arithmetic progressions of uh, of step uh, less than 
say x to the half square root x. Here is for every single progression. So I, I want on average uh, a good distribution on uh, residue class, but I, I want also for every progression, not only on average, but not too bad or not completely terrible distribution. That's why there is this third hypothesis. Does that make sense? But I, I, I mean, uh, three is not completely dominating one or two because you're only wanting one direction. Is that, is that the idea? Uh, no, it's not so much that, that it is for every uh, progression. So for every R smaller than X to the theta, while here it's for almost all R. That's why there is this averaging over R. Uh, no, but, but, but the idea would be that if, I guess, if you had both directions in, in three, then it would be stronger than one. Uh, no, because uh, like if the average, if, if every time this is uh, between two times this or one half time this, uh, this average would still be large, although this hypothesis would be satisfying. So uh, this is not stronger than this. No, I, I'm saying I'm saying the to interpret what what three is is getting, or that if if three were a bidirectional. Um... Yeah, even if it was bidirectional, because this is not uh, well, because there is an implied constant. This doesn't imply the first one, because if uh, this is if say this is. Uh, between two times this and one half times this, then uh, you can't say anything about one because the difference could still be large. The difference could be like uh, as large as uh, the left-hand side, essentially. Yeah, thanks. I'm not sure I make sense, but I'm trying to say that uh, so you ask if I have a, this bound in both directions. So imagine the weight of omega n is uh, about uh, one half of the total weight on each, uh, well, is at most uh, one half of uh, one rth of the total weight of the sequence. Uh, then uh, the difference between the weights can still be large because this, this difference here is only a multiplicative difference. Here you're taking the additive difference. So this could be still large. Even if they are within a, a constant factor of each other, the difference can be large. So the, the condition three, even uh, reinforced with a corresponding lower bound doesn't imply the condition one. I'm not sure I'm very clear, but. Uh, Other questions or comments? <clears throat> oh, if not, uh, let us thank Pierre again for a very nice talk. And um, let's see, next week, Brandon Hansen from Georgia is going to speak on the sum product problem. So that's. All right. Coming attractions. What? Sorry. So the coming attractions next oh, week. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brandon Hansen, who works with uh, Rudnick and Roche Newton and various others, uh, yeah. is talking about some product. My former colleague in Bristol. No, actually, no. I'm... Anyway. Yeah. Rudnick. You mean Rudnick, not Rudnick, though, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rudnick. <laughs> The guy in Bristol, not the guy in Tel Aviv. Okay. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Thank you all, everyone. All right. Have a good week. Stay safe. Um, uh, I can give you my uh, um, movie recommend, my TV recommendation du jour. It is, um, this is very strange. 
I thought I was watching, I was going to be watching a French detective story. It was about a, a detective from Paris who evidently got in trouble and he was exiled to be the homicide detective in Brittany, in France. So I turned, the, so I like to watch some TV when I exercise and on, on Amazon Prime. And I turned on what I thought would be this French detective series, but they were speaking German. Um, so it's a German TV series called Inspector Dupin. And, uh, but it's German, they don't speak French. And um, at this um, um, Balu conference, and it's actually quite good, uh, but you have to be, you know, you have to, it's in German, it's not in French. And uh, so at this Balu conference, Jean-Marc Desouillet was there and we were chatting and I said, have you heard of this TV series? Because it's like, it's about a French detective, but it's in German, but now it's in America. And he said, no, no, it's like it, it flew over France directly to, to the US. Um, but um, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. And I never realized how beautiful Brittany is. I mean, I mean, Maybe they just picked the beautiful places to film, but it's extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, and I hadn't realized that it's a Celtic speaking country, at least originally, and that there was at least at one point a, um, uh, a separatist movement in Brittany. Uh, but well, in linguistically, it's closer to Scotland and Ireland and Wales than it is to anything that is continental. So. Indeed. No, as you know, you, you need to fight hard if you want to find a single person speaking seriously good in this language. No one does anymore, I'm afraid. Well, so I looked it up on uh, Google and Wikipedia, and as is often ha like is happening in Wales, uh, they now will teach uh, Breton in the schools. So there are a small number of native speakers left, uh, because at some point France decided everyone should speak French and they outlawed uh, teaching in that in the Breton language, yeah. but uh, yeah. they're trying. It's like if you go to Scotland, they're trying to um, uh, support the speaking of Gaelic. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. it was just a part of France. I didn't know. About, I knew the name, but I didn't realize uh, I didn't know anything about it. So. Uh -huh. I, I just want to mention that I know if you are a rather prominent scientist in the US who speak uh, Breton, one of them is rather famous. His name is Jan Lecan, L-E-C-U-N, and he's a chief scientist of, of Facebook. Yes, yes, very strong, yeah. You're right. yeah. So he does. <laughs> does he really speak Breton? I'm not sure. Well, it's my opinion, you know, oh. I, yeah. anyway, and, I, and some other people's opinion. Yeah. But it was just a completely new to me. I mean, it was, just, it was always just a name that I had heard, but I never, certainly never been there and I hadn't seen. So, uh, so someday, if they allow uh, Americans to fly into Europe again, um, I'm not sure if we are allowed to actually, but yeah, you are allowed to, I suppose. You just need to find a flight, and which is not too expensive. Mainly the test, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, to France, you're not really supposed to fly these days, but to Germany, you can try. Um, but I was speaking to someone in Germany about asking whether there was a meeting. Uh, oh, there was a birthday meeting for Alain Plan in uh, uh, Lumini uh, earlier this year. And I certainly couldn't go because of COVID. And I was talking to a friend of mine in Germany and I asked him whether he was going. And he said, absolutely not. That uh, if he went, at least at that time, he would, it was first, it was discouraged. And second, he would have been quarantined for a long time when he got back. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of true, yes. Yeah. Anyway. So, 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 Piri, do you know what's happening with transit passengers to France? Like, so if I uh, suppose uh, have to change flights in France, do I have to stay for 10 days or do I have to, like, I can I move within one day? Like, if it's less than 24 hours. So, where do you fly from? <laughs> so, I'm flying from uh, Tel Aviv to Copenhagen. But the point, the, the problem is that like not all flights are coming to Israel at the moment. Like only flights from Germany and France, I think, are coming. So only the flights which are coming will go back. 
and the um, other flights are getting cancelled. So I thought of like buying a ticket for Paris and then within 24 hours leaving Paris for Copenhagen. Yeah, I think I think you're fine. If you stay then less than uh, 48 hours, you don't need uh, to do much. You okay. Test, I think. Okay. But you probably need a test to change country anyway. Uh, yeah. So you don't need to do any ground time in any case. Oh, okay. However, there is the little problem of uh, you're not supposed to fly to France from outside of the EU these days, except serious reasons. That may be an issue. Uh, I think from Israel, they have allowed, like, without this reason. Yeah, you're I right. Think from Mark. They allowed uh, a few yeah. countries. Israel, yeah. yeah. But, but you're going for a job, so that's always a very good reason, I would think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Doesn't consider but it's not in France, right? It's in Copenhagen. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, but you're right. If it's from Israel, actually, yeah, it belongs to the countries that are allowed, actually. So, do you have your COVID passport? Me, you know. <laughs> yes, I have the green pass. Yeah, yeah. I, I have think. the green pass. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it is recognized in Europe. No, so, okay. yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, good okay, luck. everyone. Um, same time, same place next week. Um, uh, stay well. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Wear a mask. <laughs>